Good morning. Welcome to Alexandria Covenant. We are glad to see you here, glad that you've joined us for worship. Uh, for those of you that we can't see and hear, but over in the great room and joining us online, we welcome you and acknowledge that you're here as well. It's a good day to be together to praise our God. And if you happen to be a guest with us today and you're considering making Alexandria Covenant your church home, we would invite you to fill out a Connect card. They're on the back of the pew in front of you, uh, but that just gives us an opportunity to get to know you and connect with you during the week. Uh, if you're joining us online, we have an online option for that form. It's on our website, or you can go to our church app and find the link there. As we are going to worship together, and we're readying our hearts to sing songs of praise, to observe communion together, to hear preaching and teaching from God's word, I want to read from Psalm 86. This is a psalm of David, and he says, Among the gods there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. So we're going to invite you, stand and join us as we worship our God together.
you see a mountain move And as I walk through the shadows Your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now For I am safe with you So when I fight I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet I sink through the night Stand against the power of our God You shine in the shadows You win every battle Nothing can stand against the power of our God An almighty fortress You go before us Nothing can stand against the power of our God You shine in the shadows great message, the battle belongs to the Lord. You can take a seat. We are going to have the opportunity to have communion together this morning. It's something that we do regularly here and something God commanded us to do regularly, and it's just an awesome opportunity to remember what Jesus did on the cross for us. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and it says this, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself on the night when he was betrayed. The Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces, and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with his blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily 
is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. This uh, passage tells us that there's three different areas of communion. One is, at the the last verse we read, to examine ourselves, to make sure that we are uh, right before the Lord, uh, that there's no sin in our life before we come and take communion. So if there's some things that you're harboring today, some things that you haven't confessed before the Lord, just right where you're sitting, you can confess those before God, and God will forgive those sins, and then you come to the table in a clean way. The second part it talks about is the bread, which represents Jesus' broken body. Jesus took that pain and suffering on his own body so he wouldn't have to go through that. And in that way, he's really expressing how much he loves us. And the third part is the blood, the blood that's represented by the cup. Uh, Jesus' blood was spilled for us. It was the only way we could have forgiveness of sin. So that forgiveness piece is is described and and immortalized in this communion service as well. So those are the parts of communion. I'm going to ask the servers to come on up um, and get prepared. If you're at home, um, if you want to prepare your elements, we'll take communion together when we're done serving this body here. You can, um, when it's time, you can get up and go off to the right um, and come down. You'll be served. You can take the bread, eat the bread there, and drink the cup. And there's a garbage can right there for your cup. And uh, so if you're ready, go ahead and come.
And for those of you online, let's take this together. The body of Christ broken view. You are loved. And the blood of Christ shed for you, you are forgiven. Lord, we thank you for what you've done on the cross. Thank you that you willingly sacrificed your life for us. Thank you that we can be redeemed by accepting that grace that you've offered for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, so glad you could join us this morning on this Communion Sunday, and if you are new with us, we have been, over the last several weeks, highlighting some different ministry areas that we have in the church, just so you can get to know a little bit about opportunities you might have to either get involved or maybe serve with one of our ministries. And hospitality and first impressions is a significant ministry in our church. Uh, In fact, if you picked up the verse card for the verse of the week on your way in, It says, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Serving, if you've done it, is a great joy. It's a lot of fun to get to know people, especially at this church. We have so many ushers, greeters, uh, first impression people who do hospitality, uh, who do food, because really when you read the term hospitality in the Bible, some things are common. It's always about somebody you don't know, and it involves food a lot of the time too. So it's a great opportunity if you were ever interested in serving. We could always use more people. Uh, We did a training a a few weeks ago, and we had over 87 people, and And that's just a small percentage of those that we have who are waiting to serve, whether it be at the welcome desk or just opening a door on a Sunday or helping people find a seat if they're not able to make it quite on time. All of those are super important ministries. And so I'd encourage you, uh, thank an usher, thank a greeter today, tell them how much you love them, and maybe ask how you can get involved too. And I'll turn it over to Pastor Greg to talk about the senior adults. Yes, my name is Greg Donnelly, and I'm a pastor, one of the pastors here, excuse me, And my area is those who are 65 and above. So those are called the seniors. That's how we define a senior in our church here. But uh, when you think about that, I want you to think about this verse for a minute. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, where it says, To everything there is a season. And you think about life, and we go from season to season to season. But when you get to become a senior... What you're doing is you're, you're in the second half of life. And so we want to do our life really carefully. And so uh, here's another verse. And that's from uh, Psalm 92, verse 14, where it says, they, they will still bear fruit in their old age. Yes. It's a great verse when you're a senior. But uh, we want to finish well. And so as we, do want, as we do want to finish well, we are pushing a lot about going to Bible studies, connecting with people, helping with different ways to serve, because it really makes a difference in our lives. And we want to, as I said, finish well. We do have a variety of Bible studies as seniors, and there's a lot we can join in with different generations and take in a lot of different things. Alpha is one starting next week. Uh, some good stuff is coming up. And we need to, I'm going to say we, we need as, as seniors to mix in with the younger crowds because we want to keep bearing fruit. Amen? It was stronger in the first service, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, the teachers, for example, we're starting one is called Aging Faithfully. And it's, uh, it's a good one. To, it's a great one, I think, coming up. Uh, I teach on, on Thursday afternoons at 1 o'clock in the patio. And uh, I don't see a lot of seniors here, but if you haven't attended, join us sometime because it's really a, a wonderful time to just be around the Word and around others, too. We have social events. We have dinners. Uh, we have times when we go to different areas. of the. Uh, for example, we went up to Jasper Theater up by... Uh, Park Rapids, and uh, next month we're going down to St. Paul to the, so they call it <clears throat> Paddle Ford uh, Riverboat, and it's not something we paddle, we're not doing that, but we're 
It's a big wheel that keeps the ship going. And so we go up and down the Mississippi, and it's going to be October 11th. So it's a great time for the change of the colors for the leaves. Um, Medora next summer, we're <clears throat> working toward that. But there's times to be together. And one of the things about the church is great, and that is, is we have a bus. To be able to get around, it just makes it so much less expensive to do that. Now, when I send out an email from my group, for my group, it goes to 367 individuals. That's a lot of people. And so I'm just saying to the seniors now, don't be overwhelmed with that because, because you just break it down. It's just simply getting to know one another. And you can't get to know everybody, but you can get to know someone. And you can make an imprint in that person's life. And they can do the same in your life. We need one another. We need each other. So in this season of your life, come and connect with us. You'll be glad you did. Amen. Thanks, Dave and Greg. Hey, I've got a few announcements that I want to make sure we highlight. Uh, they are in your bulletin, so make sure you take a look at those. The first is Alpha. You've been hearing about this, but it starts on September 14th, 6 o'clock. 6 p.m. in the hall. It's a time for um, a meal together, uh, video teaching, and then some discussion around the teaching in different areas of faith. Great thing for you to be involved in, for your family to be involved in, for a neighbor or co-worker to be involved in, to find out more about what um, different parts of the faith are. Um, so if you are interested in doing that, sign up. You can do it with the QR code that's in your bulletin or online or contact the church office. We also have a men's golf event coming up. It's an annual event. Um, it's 9.30 a.m. on September 16th at Hardwood Hills. Um, again, you can sign up with a QR code. Um, but this is a great time for men to get together and just hit a ball around and walk around and get to know some other men. Um, whether you are really good at golfing or not so good at golfing, it's just a great time of fellowship. There's a lunch included. So make sure if, if this is something that interests you, sign up and get to know some more people. We have fall kickoff starting this next week. Next Sunday is our fall kickoff for Sunday school. And then we have later that week and Wednesday night, we have our fall kickoff for our Awana program and our youth ministry program. Um, it's a great time. We always look forward to this time. Summer is a great um, break. And we do some many different things in the summer. But we, th we're excited about what's going to happen in just the next few days. So if you are um, interested in any of those things that are happening next Sunday or next Wednesday, make sure you get plugged in. Um, in our, on, at the welcome desk, there's a, a brochure. It's called the Engage brochure. And it just gives a list of all kinds of things that are happening this fall. So pick one up and get engaged. We have an offering that we take at the end of the service. You can also give online in a variety of different ways. Um, but thank you for giving faithfully. It allows us to do the things like the fall launch and the programming we're doing. It allows us to do things here in Alexandria, our region, but also around the world. We have Kids Church, as we do every um, Sunday during uh, the summer. Um, so if you have kids four years old up to second grade, um, you can dismiss them now. There's some friendly faces out there waiting for them. If you are new and don't have, don't have them registered, go out with them and they can register you and get ready for ch Kids Church. Why don't you stand up and greet each other? Good to see everyone here this morning. Welcome. Uh, I'm glad that you're here joining us. Uh, I don't remember if I introduced myself previously, but I'm the, the small beard pastor here on staff, um, Pastor Dave. Hey, I got to clap for my small beard. That's great. Feeling the love. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I, uh, that's really throwing me off a little bit. <clears throat> 
One thing I did forget, and maybe it was because when Greg was talking about the seniors paddle event, all I could just picture was Greg paddling the whole time. So I, I forgot to mention this, but when it comes to our like gathering coffee time, uh, this year we've, this summer we've had our overflow up in the great room. Next Sunday, that overflow is going to move back into the patio. So the coffee, the cookies, the donuts, it'll all still be in there. So get it, spend time socializing, hanging out, use that room, but just be respectful and know that once we start the service, we're going to put it up in the screen on there, and it's a great place if you have maybe a restless kid, or you have to come and go early or late. It's just a great spot to watch the service, so just be mindful of those people who are in there trying to take the service in at that time. Uh, The other thing I want to mention is we had both a fourth grade boy and a sixth grade girl accept Christ at Lake Beauty. We praise God for that. I love camp ministry, and I know God does valuable, valuable things in the lives of young people at camp, and so what a phenomenal thing to celebrate uh, what God's doing there, and know that a couple of our own uh, made a profession of faith just recently at Lake Beauty. So whether you are a first-timer or you're a long-timer, you've been here all summer, maybe a lot longer, maybe you've just come for the first time and you're visiting, we've been through a series on the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes are at the beginning of Matthew chapter 5, which is Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount. And there are a series of characteristics that followers of Jesus Christ live out their lives like. Uh, They're not what you automatically become when you say yes to Jesus. They are what you mature into as you follow the Savior, and that's who we become like. We've been talking about that for the last several weeks, and now we're standing on the threshold of a new year, right? We have all the fall transition coming up, and so we have schools, work changes, sports changes, all kinds of things in our community and culture. Uh, Hopefully, I don't think the weather is changing. It's supposed to be pretty steamy today, so maybe enjoy one last day with water or outdoors. Um, Hopefully we have a little warmer fall too, but we just have changing going on. And this sermon is the epilogue of the Beatitudes and one I want you to think about as we move into a new series on Ephesians, because I promise you that this text we're going to look at today will serve you regardless of the season you're in, the place in life, or the changes that you're going through this text will make a big difference in your life. So open up to Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to look at verses 24 through 29. And as you're opening that up, if you're able to, I would ask that you would stand with me and honor God as we read his word in this moment. So Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29 goes as following. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Please remain standing as I pray. Father God, we stand before you right now, and we recognize that beneath us is a foundation not only literally in this building and in this room, but in our lives. God, there are so many ways that we rely on, but don't think about our foundations. And so I pray, God, this morning that you would challenge our hearts to reveal the kind of foundations we have and to do the important work of investing ourselves in the most unshakable foundation of them all, in you, Jesus. I pray these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. At the time of its collapse, it was the largest concrete reinforced structure to have ever been demolished by implosion. Weighing in at 55,000 short tons, it was nicknamed the Leaning Tower of South Padre Island. It was designed as a 31-story luxury apartment with 147 units in it valued 
at each unit being $2 million and up. It had sweeping views of the ocean that you could see for miles from. It was filled with gyms, swimming pools, spas, and even a movie theater. Once completed, at 445 feet tall, it would have been one of the tallest structures in the Rio Grande Valley. But the ocean tower had a problem. It had a major flaw. It had a bad foundation. You can't tell from the picture behind me, but there was about a 12 to 14 inch sinking of the foundation on one side of the structure. So they got it up to its fullest height. They didn't finish it. And there it stood. Ultimately, after going back and forth between the developer, the const- all the construction companies, the engineers, the architects, they promised people, which they sold over 100 units to this place already, they promised people will finish it, it'll get done. And then it was ultimately determined because of the foundation failure, there was no way this thing was going to continue to stand. And so on December 13th, 2009, a whole bunch of people got together, got their buckets of popcorn out. In fact, it was a huge boost to the local economy because people came in from everywhere. They surrounded it from a safe distance. They hired a contractor to come in and implode the structure, and it fell with a great crash. So let me pose the self-evident question to you this morning, and it's, it's this. Why do foundations matter? Why do they matter? And think about this even further. We all have them, not just in our homes. (laughs) And you know if you've ever had foundation issues, maybe on your lake shore or under your deck or or, or the, the concrete base of your house, you know if you have foundation problems, it's a big deal. But think about it when it comes to your married life, the foundation of your relationship with your spouse. Think about it in your family. I remember when uh, I've had both my grandfathers pass away, and, and in both instances when they passed, I realized that, that something changed because they were a foundational rock in our family gatherings. We have these in our community. In fact, I've had some family up this weekend, and as I have driven them around town and we've talked about things, I, I talk about the great machining industry we have in this town, the number of small businesses and, and the hospital system and the schools and all the wonderful rocks in our community that, that shape who we are as a town. We have foundations in our friendships. We have foundations financially, where you invest your money determines where you and what you have left at the end of your life and what you live off of. We have foundations all over the place and they matter. I don't think you'll disagree with me on that. They really matter. And if we don't pay attention to them, things happen. But consider this, everyone, everyone builds on a foundation. Everyone in this room, everyone in this building, everyone in this town from the very youngest to the very oldest. We all build on a foundation in our lives. Think back to the parable that I just read in Matthew chapter 7. Parables, uh, as Jesus told them, were, were short stories that he used to illustrate a point, much like I did with the ocean tower. It was, it was an illustration, but it was meant to convey a truth. And oftentimes he told the parables so that people who didn't care about the truth wouldn't be able to discern what was actually true. So we have this story And everyone in the story builds a foundation, every single person. The two builders, both of them said, I'm going to pick this foundation, I'm going to pick that foundation, but they both chose one. We all choose one. That's what we do. It's what it's like to be human. Whether you choose where to invest your money, whether you choose what meal to eat repeatedly and how that affects your health, or how you choose which activities to spend your time doing, we all only have 24 hours a day. But we all pick a foundation. We all choose where to build the structures of our lives. We do this in every area that we live in. Uh, One of my more favorite recent books, uh, Atomic Habits, James Clear, he gives this quote, and I just love it. It makes so much sense, and it says this, every action you take is a vote for the type of person you wish to become. So if you ever end up in a place in your life where you're like, I don't like the type of person I become, you're the one who voted for them. (laughs) right? We do this all the time. And it's so easy to blame outside circumstance. And I get it. There are things that we can't control in life. We can't control a lot of things in life. 
We can't control what the economy does and how that impacts our jobs. We can't control uh, maybe a health situation that came up in our family that we weren't expecting or a break in relationship where we've done our part, but the other person's not willing to reconcile. There's things we cannot control. But yet we all choose the foundation that we build on in every area in our lives. And in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses more investment language a little earlier in, Ma- in Matthew chapter six. So if you flip back a little bit to Matthew chapter six, verse 19, I wanna read this because it illustrates the same point and Jesus just repeats it using different language. But here's what he says in verse 19. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The text is so implicit here that we not only choose a foundation, but we also choose where we store up our treasure. We pick. We can't control the thieves, the moths. We can't control the storms. We can't control any of that stuff. But we are the ones who choose where we put our things, where we invest our hearts, our lives. And it matters so much because wherever our treasure is, not my words, Christ's words, wherever our treasure is, there your heart will be also. Um, I, huge Minnesota sports fan and uh, grew up with the opportunity to go to a lot of, a lot of Vikings games. And I had a partial season ticket package in 1998 as a 17-year-old that was given to me by my grandfather. And I don't know why he gave it to me other than he was going south. And he's like, hey, my boss gave these to me. And, and here, why don't, you, why don't you have them for the rest of the season? And I'm like, sweet. So never afford on my own. So I took these tickets and I, I mean, purple face paint every week. I mean, I decked myself out. I, I skipped church for, for a few Sundays in a row. Um, but, but I was at the Vikings game all the time in 1998. And if you're familiar with that year, that was the year of this guy named Randy Moss. That was the year of the NFC championship game, missing the field goal wide, which I had tickets to that too. I mean, it was, it was horrible. Like it was so beautiful and it was so horrible at the same time. I was like, man, those games were so good. I thought we were going to the Super Bowl. I've only cried twice in my life for a sporting event. And it was in 1998 and 2009. If you know Vikings fan, you know what I'm talking about. But what I did is I just invested I invested my emotions, I invested my mood, I invested my money, I put my heart into that team, especially that year. And it was so difficult for me. And my wife, you know, and I've somewhat grown out of this, somewhat, uh, but my wife knew as we first got married that when the, whatever the outcome of the Vikings game was, she knew if they won, I'd be great to be around. But if they lost, I was crabby, I was grouchy, like I just, you just couldn't be around me. And what happened was, just a principle. Wherever you put your heart, <laughs> wherever you put your treasure is how your heart goes. And so I treasured something, and then that something had all these issues, and then that caused me to have a lot of issues. Foundations support life. Foundations support life. And as our foundations go, so does our lives. Um, I got permission to tell this story, and he may be tuning in in this, this service, uh, but a couple of years ago, I did a wedding here uh, just a couple weeks after deer season, and two weeks prior to that, I was sitting up in my deer stand, and I was sitting up there, and I, I got the phone call followed by a text message um, from Morgan Silbernick, and, uh, and Morgan told me, she said, um, my fiance Darren has fallen out of his deer stand and broke both of his legs. Two weeks prior to the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh my goodness, what's going to happen as the pastor officiating the wedding? Like all these thoughts are going through my head. First and foremost, I was concerned for his well-being. Like, is he okay? I did ask him his permission to, to share the story. And he said it was totally fine. And he encouraged it. And he said he's going to be tuning in. So if I miss any details, Darren, you let me know. Uh, but here's the, the bottom line. His brother said, hey, why don't you go pick this deer stand over here? And so he went over to this deer stand. And then the deer stand didn't have a great foundation. And it collapsed. 18 feet. He still chose that stand, right? We choose our foundations, and as the foundations go, so does our lives. Wherever you choose to put yourself, you put yourself in a position to either succeed or to crash. But we choose the foundations. 
It turned out okay. I've actually never seen a guy on crutches be so excited and come down the aisle so fast. Uh, but he did it, and they got married, and it was a great wedding, and they're just a wonderful couple. And so uh, just so you, you're all not wondering what happened to him after that. But let's look back at this text one more time. Look at Matthew 7, 24. I want to point something out to you. 7.24 says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And whenever you see that word therefore, I always think of what is before. This comes at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. So what Jesus is saying is, everything you just heard me say, all this stuff from chapter 5, verse 1, all the way through chapter 7, all these things, Whoever puts these things into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Then in verse 26, Matthew 7, 26. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. But I want you to notice some of the similarities here. Everyone in this story picks a foundation, like I mentioned earlier. They all choose one. Everyone builds a structure. Now, if you were to, to drive through your, your division or subdivision, or maybe you live out in the country and you just drive past your neighbor's house, you just don't see people's foundations until there's a problem, <laughs> right? Like foundations, you can have a, a whole division of houses that are all built the same, and you would never know which one had a foundation issue. But they'd all look the same on the top. Maybe they all have the same materials, similar roof style. They all have similar windows and doors. They could all come from... In this story, the structure isn't what's important. Jesus makes actually no comment about the actual structure because likely the two builders got materials from the same place and had almost the identical structure. And to that point, everyone in the story hears the word of God. They all hear it. They all have the same structure. They all build. Structures don't look that different, but there is one catalyst. Foundations are revealed by the storm. Your foundation is revealed by the storm. So everything in this passage is the same except for the storm and the outcome. And the point is that storms will come. Storms will come. This might be you here today. You may be going through a storm. Maybe it's in relationship to some changes this fall. Maybe it's in your married life. Maybe it's in a family circumstance. Maybe it's in a health crisis. Uh, Maybe it's in a work situation. All of us are going to experience storms. That is what the text is so clear on. It's not an if, but a when. Uh, thinking right now about the hurricane that just landed in Florida and, and looking at all the destruction that took place because of the storm. But you know what's really odd to me? Whenever you look at that, and we should be praying for those people and all those, the workers who are helping clean that up. And you know, every time you see those pictures, you see there's always one or two houses that stand, right? Even in the midst of what seems to be total devastation. And I would wager that the reason some of these homes stand is for for two reasons, really, because they have a really strong foundation and an awesome structure, one to withstand the storm. But you can have a really good structure and a poor foundation and it won't stand. (laughs) Foundations are so important. If you've ever been told this, this is a little aside from, from the main text, but if you've ever been told this, that being a Christian made life easier, (laughs) you were lied to. Being a Christian doesn't make life easier. Better, yes. More firm in your conviction and foundation. Of course it does. But being a Christian doesn't mean that all of a sudden things go really easy. Because that's not what Jesus says in this text. He said that the storm affects both builders. He doesn't say that the one who had Christian beliefs and attended church didn't experience the storm. No, they experienced the storm too. The same Phrase used in verse 25 and 27, the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, happened to everyone. Everyone builds and everyone experiences the storm. The storm shows us what you can't see in a person's life. The same way that a storm reveals 
what you didn't know about a person's foundation, a home's foundation. You just don't know these things, but they happen to everyone. Um, I spent some time a couple weeks ago in the Boundary Waters canoe area, and uh, some people are like, wow, that's your idea of fun, like going out in the woods and paddling 47 miles with a canoe, which might have happened, and then setting up a tent and being alert for bears and hanging your food up on a tree and, and fighting off some mosquitoes. And then you... I love it, and here's why I love it, because it, it makes me vulnerable and exposes me. I like that because a couple of reasons. Number one, when I'm out in the woods and I don't have my phone, it doesn't even actually work. <laughs> like physically, it doesn't work other than to take pictures. It makes me think about all the things I don't normally think about. All of a sudden, these little thoughts and emotions I've been wrestling with, stuff that I normally just kind of put to the side because in daily life, you know this is true. There's so many things going on. Oftentimes, we don't stop to think about what God's been doing in our life or maybe areas that we need to really reveal our foundation. We don't think about that stuff. But here's me in the woods, and every day about 2 o'clock, I just, the thoughts start coming on. I'm like, man, I got a lot of stuff going on in my head. And there's, there's some anxiety there. There's some stuff I need to confess. There's some things I just need to thank God for that I haven't yet. And so I'm processing all this. I'm writing it down and journaling. And every day I did that while I was out there. And God just did a, a great work. He let me see my foundation in a way I don't normally see because I'm so surrounded by everything that's normal. In fact, I think that's why things like camp ministry and retreats and trips, those are so powerful taking a family vacation, all of a sudden you don't see your family in the normal light because you're all outside of your home and your town and and you have these moments that you share together. It's why those are so powerful. But here I am in the Boundary Waters and the forecast said this. It said, oh yeah, it's gonna be sunny. There's gonna be no rain. It'll be like highs in the mid 70s, lows in the 50s and you'll be good, good to go. Like, okay, weather forecasters. All right, so here's me when I get out there. I don't trust them. <laughs> so I'm like putting up my rain tarp, putting everything down and sure enough, At 3 a.m. on the second day, third day we're out there, 3 a.m., the rains just start beating down on my tarp. I sleep in a hammock in the tree. That's how I prefer to camp when I do that, and so I put a tarp over the top. One of the things I know is that you better have a firm foundation to put your pegs in, to to put guy lines out for your tarp. You just better do that. Because if you don't, and the storm comes, you're in big trouble. And then what do you do? You get soaking wet. You can't just paddle out during the storm and go to the closest hotel in Ely. It doesn't work like that. When you're in the middle of the storm, it's really hard to work on your foundation, right? So here's me, 3 a.m. I'm looking out underneath my tarp and I'm like checking the sides of my hammock to see if it's wet and my lines are holding and I'm through the storm and it was all good. But storms reveal the condition of our foundation. They reveal it. They let you know how good it was or where it had failed every single time without fail. And frankly, there is no other foundation aside from Christ. Storms will quickly reveal that truth. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 3. So if you have your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 13, it'll also be on the screen behind me. It says this. Paul says, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds in this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Translation, it will all be tested. It'll all be tested, everything. And if not in this life, it will when Christ returns. Every decision we make, every vote that we make in our lives for, for, our, for our marriages, our families, our investments, our, the, way we, the way, we, way we interact with our communities, all the things, all of those foundations in our life will be tested. You see, when the storms come, it's a big deal. I talk to a lot of people as a pastor about the condition of their spiritual life. And you know what I've noticed over the course of my tenure, uh, 20 years in, in doing pastoral ministry? Here's what I've noticed, and it's this. People normally come into the pastor's office during or after the storm. I'd say 75%, maybe even more, come into the pastor's office during or after the storm. I get far fewer people 
who come to me and say, hey, Pastor Dave, you know, everything's going well in my life. I just want to I want to talk to you about the foundation. I want to make sure that, that, you know, would you do a foundation check? And like, can we talk about how I can grow as a Christian? That's very rare. But imagine if you know you're going to experience a storm and you preemptively say, you know what? I think I'm going to maybe go talk to a pastor or go talk to a trusted Christian friend. And I want them to kind of help me look at the foundation of my life and make sure that everything's set. Then when that storm comes, (laughs) You know, everything can blow down around you, but you'll be on firm foundation. Think about what that's like. And for those of you who are currently in a storm or who have just gone through, and please hear me on this, I want you to come in and talk to our staff. Our staff love to care for and are concerned with. And I want you to also have this hope that your foundation as it is on Jesus Christ will help you weather any storm. Jesus says it. It will. It's really hard to work on your foundation during the storm. Do so before it happens and know it's coming. Matthew 7, 24 and 25. Here is how you do it. Here is how you do it. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, The winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, never came down because it was founded on the rock. Don't check the box thinking that church attendance or hearing a sermon or listening to or feeling good about something that you read in the Bible is a firm foundation. It's only half the story. Everyone in this story heard They heard what Jesus said. So then why would the foundation fall? Because the one whose foundation fell failed to do it, failed to do something with it. You see, James talks about this in James 1, 22 through 25. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Circle, underline, highlight that passage. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Doing makes the difference. It just does. Doing makes the difference. So if you want a firm foundation, Our church, our staff work tirelessly to to have opportunities to get involved in small groups and and to serve and and to just be a part of community so that you can do the one another's as God calls us to do, to love one another, serve one another, to do God's word, to do what the Beatitudes say, be poor in spirit, mourning, being meek, having power under control, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, showing mercy for those who have greatly in need of it. being pure in heart and being peacemakers, all these things, we are blessed. We have a firm foundation when we do them. Not just listen, but do them. Doing makes the difference. How will you build your foundation? That is the question, because the storms are coming. Jesus offers the real hope. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I just praise you for not leaving us subject to the storm without a foundation, that you gave us your son, you gave us his word, and you gave us the instruction that we can build a foundation on the most firmest possible foundation we we ever could, and that's Christ. So Lord, may we be people who do what your word says as doing makes a difference. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen as we close this song together. Let our foundation be built on your majesty. Let every word you speak fill this home. Jesus, our cornerstone, the anchor for our souls. Your glory will be shown.
Amen. Will you this week begin building the structure of your lives on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do so and you will weather any storm. Know that our prayer team will be down front here and would love to pray with you. In fact, that's one of the things that scripture calls us to do is to pray with one another. So start now. If, you, if you're in a storm and you just need to keep that structure firmly founded, pray with somebody, encourage somebody, talk to somebody today, but go in the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and have a great day.